everybody. Welcome back to the Unstoppable Podcast. I'm your host, Diana Chen, and I'm here today with our guest, Matt Condon. He is an NFT OG, and he's got so many cool projects that we're going to talk about today, like the Digitally Rare Podcast, the many mats uh, where he actually implanted a chip into his hand. Maybe need to ask him if it's real or not. Um, <laughs> proof of Stake, S-T-E-A-K, uh, tons of just very creative, interesting projects like that. And then he's also professionally worked at companies like Google and Skillshare. So super interesting person. Um, and I'm very excited to have him on the podcast today. So welcome, Matt. Thank you. It's exciting to be on the um, receiving end of a podcast interview. Um, right, right, right. Yeah, I, I always like to ask people I bring on who are also podcast hosts if they like hosting mm -hmm. better or being a guest better. Hmm. I think it's more satisfying. Well, I can see it both ways, but I enjoy uh, having opinions about things and talking about them. So I imagine like a lot of people. So I think I enjoy being interviewed, but yeah, we'll see. I'm not used to having the answers, only the questions. You are the first person actually who said that. I, I'm at 100% right with uh, people answering that they like hosting really? better. So yeah, yeah wow. you're the first one. Wow. Yeah, you gotta you gotta get make your rounds and do this more apparently. Right. I would love to. Yeah, I'm enjoy. I'll do the podcast circuit then. Yes, do a definitely little, do. Like a tour or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Okay, I want to talk to you more about the podcast, but before that, I want to know about your background. So you're an NFT OG. Uh, before you know, tell us like, was that your first exposure to crypto, or did you get into crypto before NFTs were a thing? Take us all the way back to when you first got into crypto. Yeah, I mean, it's a pretty standard story. Um, crypto popped off in 2017, 2018. And so I like, I had seen the Bitcoin white paper on HN or something and was like, I can't understand this and threw it away. Um, but then when it popped off again, I was like, okay, cool. Let me go read it. I found that in 2017, I could finally understand what was happening, if not like totally, but I was like, oh, cool. I, I understand what this is doing. And that gave me the confidence to be like, okay, maybe I can figure out what else is happening here. Um, and yeah, just got into like writing solidity. I um, tried a few, I like prototyped a bunch of stuff, um, ended up maintaining the open Zeppelin code base for a while. Um, that was really rewarding and got to do a lot of like open source community stuff and kind of steer the project in different directions. Um, was involved with, um, I missed the CryptoPunks launch on my radar, but discovered it soon afterwards and kind of got into NFTs that way. And you know, once you once one um, starts thinking about like, oh, you have this currency thing, pretty basic idea. What's really happening is digital scarcity, and turns out almost everything else in the world is non fungible. Ta da! Like my mind was hooked. I was like, okay, cool. What does that unlock? Um, but yeah, ended up collaborating on the NFT standard seven twenty one, and then um, uh, auditing the contract for Open Zeppelin and. Um, from there, I've just been doing a lot of different stuff in the space, hosted a conference in 2018 called Non-Fungible Summit, um, have just been around. And in the 27, 2018, I was doing a lot of NFT thought leader stuff. So lots of good content from that era, which is kind of also useful today. Yeah, that is pretty wild that you basically helped create nfts as we know them today the erc 721 standard which is pretty crazy so when you first discovered this concept of nfts or not even before nfts just digital scarcity what um i guess like what what was your initial impression like how did you wrap your mind around that because i think even today a lot of people are still having a hard time wrapping their mind around, you know, what is the value behind what is essentially to the naked eye, a JPEG that I can just copy and paste and send everywhere. Yeah. And that leap of faith, and I think it is a little bit of a leap of faith is kind of interesting to me because it is sort of irrational to look at an NFT and be like, oh, okay, maybe this thing is valuable. Um, but if you look at it from a certain lens and which is that the, actual medium of an object um, is is like sort of no longer required. I guess, let me back up. What's happening with NFTs, I think, that's really neat is you've divorced the physicality of something. Um, like I have a tech deck here. This is like a physical object. Um, it has a constant aura and state through time. I can give it to a friend, blah, blah, blah. This is like an innate property of physical objects. Um, but when you get digital scarcity and you start being like, okay, NFT is one of ones, 
you suddenly have this idea that a digital thing can have this aura, this like entityness over time. Um, and that's something that just hasn't existed before. Um, and so that's like the art lens, the art perspective is like, okay, cool. Now you have digital things that can have aura. And that's just like a fundamental change in how digital, like the digital worlds that we live in work because previously, like, and this is a really cool fact is, you know, data is infinitely reproducible. You just copy paste it. Like that's amazing information, freedom, like all of that's incredible. But what's neat is now we've taken this idea of scarcity and made it a tool in the toolbox to be like, okay, cool. You can have an image, you can copy it for days, but you can also divorced from the actual access to this image, have a scarce representation with or over time of the ownership of that image. And I think that's the leap of faith that people have to take is the divorce between the ownership of something and the access of something. Those two things were previously so intertwined, they're just locked together in our physical objects. It's like the ownership of this implies that I have it and you don't. Um, but we've divorced those two concepts on the internet with NFTs and uh, digital things more broadly. And so that's like, I think, one of the harder mental leaps, or not harder, but one of the novel mental leaps that um, is sort of required when you start getting into this. It's like the kind of assumption or the leap of faith that's like, yeah, okay, we've divorced these two concepts. And well, now the ownership doesn't imply access. What does it mean? And that's up for you to play around with and decide. Gotcha. Gotcha. So it's kind of like, you know, that skateboard you were just holding in your hand, you have ownership to it and I, maybe you'll let me borrow it and, you know, display it on my desk, but I still have to give it back to you. Like, it's still not mine unless you decided to give it to me for good. That's a great point. Yeah. Is with physical objects, we can still divorce ownership from access. It just requires this higher level understanding of like, I'm loaning it to you. Um, and so what's interesting is like with NFTs, it's like, cool, I own the skateboard, but anyone in the world can do a little skateboard trick with it. You know, they can use it and, but I own it. And so the question that people obviously ask is, and then like, what's the point? Um, and I think what's really interesting about the internet, and this isn't like a new idea, but it is like extremely relevant is that now that we've sort of denoted the value of things in their distribution, for example, memes, um, to, to describe a meme as valuable, everyone knows about it, right? You have this like distribution idea. You want more people to see it and therefore it's more valuable. That sort of inversion of like previously you would buy a piece of art and put it on a wall in your house and only the people you know would see it is what makes it valuable. Now it's the opposite. You have this inversion of value where it's like you want more people to see it and that's what makes owner, owning it valuable. And it's not a new idea, right? Like this is the Mona Lisa thing. It's like, everyone's seen the Mona Lisa. That's why it's valuable. That's why it's worth owning it. And it's this like cycle. Um, but now that's happening at a much more like casual level. And so that I find is really interesting. Yeah. And that sort of reminds me of another conversation that I heard you or another talk that I heard you give. Um, and it was about the concept of like, when we are building in this new web three world in this new metaverse world with nfts and all of these new things should we be building the digital version of what already exists in the physical world or should we be building based on a, a digitally native um attitude or, or idea right can you explain yeah can you explain that a little bit more and like what your thoughts are on that yeah totally um it's the way that I, I mean, this is also something that's been widely sort of talked about both in the crypto sphere and also importantly, not in the crypto sphere, um, is this idea of when there are two different mediums. Um, for example, you are building with bricks and then we invent steel and now we're building with steel. Or in the case of um, the web, we have, um, or rather the physical world to the digital world is like, cool, we have these physical interactions between people. Now we have the digital world what one eventually what one um, sort of necessarily does when there's a new tool invented is take the old patterns that have worked and just transpose them one to one into this new medium um, and so the first bridges that were built out of seal looked just like brick bridges they had a little arch they had the thing everything was like trust and everything but what was neat is once people start learning about the material, they learn about steel, they learn about how it holds weight, et cetera. 
you start learning about suspension bridges and like all these different types of bridges that are much more effective because of the new medium. Um, and those things couldn't have existed before. And so in the similar way with this like analog to digital um, expression of how people want to interact, um, one of the things that we're seeing is, okay, we have digital art now. It is uh, has a consistent aura. It has this like thingness that makes it real, this tangibility uh, via NFTs. How do we display it? And what people are doing is saying like, okay, we live in three, you know, a three dimensional environment with walls. Um, let me take this concept of putting art on a wall and make it digital and rebuild the wall brick by digital brick. And so now we have metaverses and crypto voxels and so on. And I find that that is good, but it also is not like the perfect expression of a medium, right? And it's like those steel bridges that looked like stone bridges, they worked, they worked just fine. Things went over them, great. But it wasn't, it wasn't the perfect expression of using that medium in that context. And so I think that's something that's worth thinking about um, when designing products around NFTs is, you know, you have to solve, not solve, but you have to think about all of these things. And in doing so, I think that there's a much more native expression of how to do that online. Um, and that's going to be different from what we do in uh, the real world, or I guess the analog world, I shouldn't say real world. Yeah, so I, I know, you know, I, I'm sure if we brought, you know, a 14 year old on this show and asked them how to build a metaverse, they would probably explain it in a more digitally native world because that's the only world that they know. Whereas for us, we might default to comparing it to what we have in the physical world and trying to figure out how we can translate that into the digital world. So if we, I guess my question is just, if we did bring a 14 year old on here, which I, I don't know any, so I, I uh, couldn't invite any on here, but if we had one, what would they, how would they describe the best way of building out a metaverse? That's a really great question. Um, I guess the core thing that we're trying to solve is that um, any thing requires context in which it's meaningful. And this kind of ties into the whole like art lens of it's not really the object that matters, but the narrative, the context, the and importantly, the social interaction around this object that matters. Um, and so what we're thinking about is how do we create an environment, um, digital or otherwise, in which that you know, that object has meaning and is meaningful to me or anyone else. Um, and so, for example, like Fortnite does this really well with its skins um, because you have to look like something in the game. Um, so they have this game that's that like base level sort of sense of like why people are there. But then once you have that normalcy, you have to look like something. And so obviously everyone could look like the same character. Um, but much like real life, where people express themselves wearing different clothing and everything, like you can start to um, take that normalcy of expressing oneself and embrace that uh, such that you have like an environment, in this case, it's Fortnite, that gives meaning to the digital skins, right? It's kind of an obvious thought, but without the Fortnite game and the 3D world that everyone hangs out in, and most, most importantly, your friends are in, um, those skins have no value. And so in the same way, like if we didn't live in a society, um, like the, the self-expression via clothing would be way less important. Um, it would, you know, kind of fall back towards that utility. And so that's the sort of core problem of like, okay, we have digital art, we have digital game items, like we have all of these things in what context are they meaningful? And I used to hope that there was a sort of generalized substrate for digital objects. Um, obviously the metaverse is the like, uh, original expression of that where it's like okay cool it's a 3d world that everyone is already in everyone spends their time here there's only one um and that maps really really well to how the real world works because everyone you know exists in this one universe that we're in and this one planet earth that we're in and so we all share that um space and that's what creates this substrate in which like clothing is useful and uh, my necklace is useful like um but I don't know that that really occurs for digital um, environments. Uh, this idea of there being a one and only is kind of proven false multiple times, even in today's age of like, you know, Facebook as centralized AOL thing, like even then it's not the only player. Um, and of course, one of the amazing things of the web is that anyone can spin up an alternate universe um, 
incredibly cheaply and without permission. And so I think in that way, what will eventually happen is that the environments that make these things meaningful will be incredibly context specific, um, which is a sort of obvious thought in retrospect, because it's like, okay, cool, a game item is only useful inside of that game, um, full stop. Like, it, it's if I don't play that game, it's irrelevant to me um, from like a self-expression or um, like meaningful layer, right? And so I think um, much like things are happening today, they'll happen tomorrow in the sense that Fortnite skins will only be relevant in Fortnite and so on. And so it's sort of up to the creator, perhaps the someone who's interested in this object uh, to create an environment in which it's meaningful. Um, the sort of more generalized take, though, um, with art specifically, because art doesn't have a default context um, is like, yeah, cool. Where does art go? Um, and right now we see people putting them on their Twitter avatars, for example, um, because in the same way that Fortnite is uh, an environment in which the Fortnite skins are useful, Twitter is an environment that all of my friends are on uh, where self-expression is uh, enabled by the avatar. And so now we see the natural sort of embracing of that where it's like, cool, let me express my identity through this avatar in the social setting. Um, and so for like that example, like that in that way, profile picture avatars are useful. Um, and so, yeah, then the question is, what is the generalized substrate for art? And I'm not quite sure. Um, yeah, there's a bunch of different ways one could do it. I think I had a really good, I had a take in a previous podcast episode on Digitally Rare that was that MySpace was the perfect uh, social network for NFTs because you had this, everyone was on MySpace. You had a customizable wall. You just put your NFTs there, like minimum viable expression done. Um, and would I'd love to see that again today, but of course building MySpace is, is pretty hard and everyone's on all these different social networks and Twitter won't let me uh, edit their code base to put NFTs on my profile. So yeah. That's that's wild. I've never thought about it like that, but it does make a lot of sense. I wonder if Tom is still around. Yeah, the... he's he's on Twitter for sure. Um, I mean, he kind of you should hit he's him, a photographer you should hit now. Him up and, yeah, hit him up and pitch him on it and be like, hey, you you got to restart MySpace. <laughs> I've got a brand new use case for you. This right. is cutting edge. <laughs> hey, do you have a checkout of the code base from 2007? Um, <laughs> We could pull like an old school RuneScape thing where they take the code from 2007 and just redeploy it and there go, go from there. Yeah, yeah, yeah and really. you can just, he can still be in everyone's top nine friends, yeah. you know, uh, he What is. a culture that was. Yeah. And that's just like a perfect example of like, no one ranked their friends like that in real life, right? It's just that the platform, MySpace, gave you this means of expression, this like, hyper specific way to express yourself which is who are my top whatever friends um and then turns out people like doing that that's like a novel you know that's a very specific um means of expression and it isn't natural useful or wasn't even done in real life before that and so it's like yeah neat yeah I, i've heard a lot of people ask the question about if our nfts inherently useful or valuable or is it just prescribed and i sort of think well i guess first of all it depends like how you define inherently useful or valuable like you argue that few things few things in life are really inherently useful it just depends how you use it um but i also think that with the digital world especially that it really is all about identity it's about like your self-identity, like how you want to identify yourself. And then it's also about your social identity. So how you want to identify with the people you hang out with, the group of friends you're around. And I think that's why these NFT profile picks have gotten so big. Um, is not that it's like a recent phenomenon, like crypto punks have been around forever, but I, I have been seeing more and more projects recently pop up. And I think it's because not only can you so like, for instance, like I'm trying to find my lookalike fame lady right now to use as my profile pic. So, you know, people do that. And then not only that, but like I, you know, if I had a fame lady as my profile pic, I'd be looking for other people on Twitter with fame ladies at the, as their profile pics too. And feeling like this instant connection to them, even though obviously they're just strangers on the internet that I like have no idea who they 
but instantly I'm like, oh, we have this connection. We're both, you know, fame lady squad. And so I think it's all about, you know, that like self identity and then group identity as well. hundred percent. It's, and that's so at the core, I think of how humans operate. And this is like pretty basic, like um, what's that called? The psychology that deals with like how the brain, like, you know, uh, like primitive brain, like what's that called? Eh, doesn't matter. But yeah, it's like really baked into how humans operate. We're social creatures and like the value of anything like baseline utility. And then on top of that, like vastly more important to everyone is like the social signaling layer, the like financial stuff, which we've invented after that, like that's where like most of the interesting stuff happens. Um, especially with like NFTs, I think what's really neat is because of we've divorced physicality and the sorts of the sense of access from ownership, um, there is no inherent utility in owning an NFT because it's just a record in a database, right? That's just, you're just putting bits in a blockchain somewhere, right? That, there's no utility to that. And I think that's okay. I think that's amazing because we've totally made the, the utility, the social signaling, the financial, like all of the senses of how one could value a thing, we've made them all customizable. It's a sandbox and programmable and networked. And so you have this insane level of customizability in designing a thing. And that's like a really, really neat property. Um, so you can imbue an NFT with utility. Maybe it's like, I get to join this community. Um, that's utility. Maybe it's like, um, it's a reaction sticker and I get to drop it onto a post and express an emotion. Like that's a utility. Um, but then on top of that, you can be like, okay, cool. Now it's uh, an avatar profile. So now it's social signaling and like, maybe there's some DeFi stuff baked in. So now it's economic. Like you get to customize that. You get to build that. You get to architect the properties of a thing. And that's just really neat. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I do want to dive into some of the projects you're working on because there's a lot of cool ones and I have a million questions. Uh, I want to start with Digitally Rare. Uh, it's That's your podcast. It's all about uh, NFTs and all the other cool things in the space. So um, I'm wondering, you know, like how did you and your co-host Jonathan get the idea for it? Why did you decide to start it? And like tell people a little bit more about the podcast. Yeah. Um, Jonathan and I met each other um, for background, Jonathan is Jonathan Mann, the song a day man. He's been making a song for the last every day for the last 10 years. It's incredible. He has a world he has the Guinness world record. It's amazing. Um, we were just on Twitter at the same time in 2017 or 18. And he hit me up. He was like, want to do a podcast? And I was like, I don't have a microphone. Um, but obviously he has a lot of experience uh, podcasting pre previously and obviously doing audio stuff. And so I was like, okay, cool. Yeah, let's see what happens. Um, and we just ended up talking about NFTs a lot because that's what was interesting to us. Um, we interviewed a lot of people. We really just, yeah, talked a lot about these base concepts of, you know, what then does ownership mean once you've, you know, made it whatever you want and IP rights and licensing and the, the generative art stuff. Like we've just gone through a lot of it. Um, yeah, right now we're on a music and crypto, uh, track um obviously jonathan's a musician so we have a lot of um sort of intersection of music and crypto going on right now and that's been a lot of fun um but yeah we've been doing it for three years we took a break in the middle so that we're on season two right now um and we met for the first time at an unfungible summit in san francisco um so that was pretty fun it's like cool internet person that i've been talking to like every week for a month or so now two months three months um here you are in person neat Honestly, it's so normal now to like have internet friends. And I was oh, like, totally. the only weird part about having internet friends is meeting them in real life and seeing how tall they are. Cause yes. that's like the only thing you don't get from Zoom and video <laughs> chat. You have no idea how tall anybody is. Yep, totally. I met my uh, co-founder AJ um, in person after three months of working together and I was sitting in a chair um, and he comes up to me and, and he's like, are you Matt? And I'm like, oh shit, AJ, what's up? And then I stand up and I'm like, you're tall. And he's like, you're tall. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. That is the only weird thing about having yeah. internet friends and meeting them in real life in 2021. Yeah. Nothing yeah. else is weird about it. I do really um, so enjoy the uh, opening conversation that people do, um, which is like, are you blank from Twitter? And I'll be like, yeah, are you blank from Twitter? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's just like, cool. Yep. 
<laughs> yeah, you'll yeah, that's the other thing with crypto. You'll chat with people for months or, you know, a long time with their pseudonym mm -hmm. and you like, right. still don't know. You only Won't know them by their pseudonym. It. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I met somebody yeah, in person I, the other day and it was like, yo, I'm uh, Okiki from Twitter. I'm like, who? And they're like, oh, no good twits. And I'm like, oh, yeah. <laughs> now I know who you are. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. Do you have you actually introduced yourself as one of many mats in person? Uh, occasionally, as like a sort of semi ironic, like, um, I'll be like, yo, I'm Matt, one of the many, you know, I'm just like yeah, joking about how many mats there are. Um, right, right. But yeah, I think it's, it's kind of like an artist, artisty uh, name now. It's kind of like, especially coming from the like the art project of the chip in the hand or i guess the nft in the hand um it's like kind of an artist it's got an artist into it yeah yeah uh before we dive into that i was gonna ask do you have if you had to name your top three favorite podcast guests that you've had on digitally rare Ooh. or like top three favorite episodes what would they be goodness we have some really really classic like time-honored episodes that are just like quintessentially useful i think um Jason Bailey and um uh uh good goodness the the rare Pepe guy Joe Looney um have really uh, iconic episodes where we talk about for example with Joe Looney we talked about this it's called the space between the image and the token or something um where we talk about yeah the divorce of access and ownership and what do you own and so on and then with Jason we get a lot of fantastic art history background and a lot of like coming from the art world since he's done um, Art Gnome, for example. Um, I always love having Matt Stevenson on, uh, just he's brilliant. Yeah, I know you talked to him uh, last episode. Um, fantastic uh, guy to chat with. Um, but yeah, I mean, honestly, I never, everyone's been pretty, pretty amazing. And of course, like the key to a good podcast, but the key to a good podcast IMO is having a good interviewee. Um, and so it's just like, yeah been really great to have everybody on a hundred percent and then do you have a dream guest that you haven't had on yet oh goodness you know i haven't thought about that but obviously like my twitter feed is full of people i'd like to chat with um i should put more i should just dm them and see if they want to chat yeah good yeah that's yeah. what i do yeah and it, i guess it worked <laughs> it works yeah yeah, yeah. for sure for sure. Okay, cool. Well, I want to talk about the this very cool project. You have a chip in your hand, mm -hmm. um, quite literally. Tell us about this project. It's for anybody who's not familiar with the many mats. It's just the many mats dot um, yeah. Tell us like what is this project? Is is the chip for real? Like what? <laughs> I I've never met anybody who chips themselves. Yeah. Uh, most people are like freaking out about the government like chipping right. people whatever and you just yeah. went ahead and tip yourself so yeah just it is lots a bit of questions ironic. but go ahead and just tell us about it <laughs> yeah well i guess an, uh, an nft in the hand is worth two on the chain as they say um but yeah i have uh two chips in my hand actually i have uh, i also have the shrug there um one of them is here and i change that one pretty frequently right now it points to a light paper that i wrote um and this one here is the nft um Pretty hard to see, but if you're watching, uh, there's a little area here with like a slight bump. It's in there. Um, and it's an NFC tag, um, same technology you put on, put in your pets. It's the same technology you, um, you know, you tap your phone to a, a fob or like, you know, key cards, whatever. Um, yeah, so you can read it with your phone. And so what I've done is put a cryptographic signature on there uh, embedded in a link such that whomever scans it uh, then has permission to mil mint themselves one of the many mats. Um, and of course, I have four different mats that you can get, and they're all random. And so I generate a link and without looking, put it on my hand. And then the next person who scans it can then go redeem themselves uh, a mat. And so let me pull up one of them on my phone here to show to anyone who's watching. There we go. Here, for example. Oh, there we go is bagel mat. And so we have uh, just a bunch. And so here's the, let's see if it's visible on the screen, but you can tap your phone against the thing. And of course it's a bit hard to do this um, upside down. There's like a very specific angle because this thing is a very small antenna. There it is. You saw the pop up. Oh um, yeah. And that will go, let's see which one we got. Wait, so is that like a QR code? 
It's exactly it's this it includes the same. Oh, we got a moto mat. Load the image, please. Oh, nice. <laughs> okay, my Wi-Fi. Oh, there it is. Um, yeah, there it is. Yeah, and so then you can connect your wallet and um, bring it to any crypto wallet you'd like on ETH mainnet. And so um, basically, all I was doing with this is interrogating the ideas of. I, mean, I think this is conceptual art. Um, interrogating the ideas of one digital scarcity and two um, non-financial non distribution mechanisms. Um, so one, the only way to get this digitally scarce thing is to meet me in person, which is a physically like and time bound event. Um, so that's just kind of interesting. Um, so now you know if anyone has this on chain, they've been in my proximity um, at least once. <laughs> And uh, you kind of actually know exactly when because that's on chain as well. That's a bit odd. Um, but yeah, so for example, like there's a, when I went to the tweet up the other week, there's a bunch of on chain events of people scanning my hand and redeeming that tokens. And so it's like, oh, cool, there's a tweet up happening. Um, and then the other thing is like, you know, it's no surprise or it's no um, new knowledge to anyone that like crypto is very financial. Um, and the most natural way we, I think, in a capitalist society to distribute a scarce resource is money. Um, and I find that really frustrating um, because it's both the easiest and therefore like, you know, if you're trying to distribute something, just charge people for it. And that's a very like easy way to decide who gets what amount of it. Um, but at the end of the day, the more interesting things to me don't involve money. And so, um, you know, uh, this is just a way to distribute something that is free the requirement is that you meet me in person um, or find one of the mat stickers around the world, which there are at least 300, um, mostly in Brooklyn and the US. Yeah, what's the deal with the stickers? Do you Is it just wherever you travel to, you'll bring stickers and you'll just stick them around random places? Yeah, it's just a fun thing. Um, if once Once one starts paying attention to the stickers on the street, you'll never see the city the same way. Um, you'll start recognizing people. There are just absolutely iconic um, sticker people, at least in the area that I'm in, in Brooklyn. Um, you start seeing the same names everywhere. You start seeing these um, these um, aesthetics and everything. And it's just like, cool, there's like a weird, weird community out here of a bunch of people who I can only assume haven't met um, because there's no way to find these people unless it's, you know, a link to their project or something. But it like, it's just placing stickers on street poles and on public property, blah, blah, blah. And so like there are people like the big chef dog who stay cooking. You just see that sticker everywhere. It's on every corner. Um, there's Kest Gak. There's like all of these things that are iconic and they all have different areas that they clearly roam in. Um, and so, yeah, I just wanted to join that. And I had this sticker uh, of my face and I was like, cool. Yeah, let me print a bunch and put them around the world. And now if you find one, you can get a digital one as well. That is super awesome. And what do the stickers look like? Is Are they all the ones you showed me earlier or are they they're different versions? There are four different and I'm actually commissioning more. So there will be a whole Poke, Pokedex of Matt stickers. Um, nice. Wait, inspired so how will, people by... know, how will people know if the sticker is a Matt sticker or something else? Um. Well, we've got NFTs and digital scarcity. Oh, you mean the physical ones? Um, yeah, the physical one. It's got yeah. my name on it. <laughs> oh, it does. Okay, okay. Um, okay. But there is a look. I don't have any more, I don't think. Um, yeah, I placed the last one um, maybe a week ago, and I need to order more. But it's a picture of me with a bucket hat and uh, a blonde beard. I was I had dyed it blonde at the time. And a bunch of flowers in the beard. And it, in the hat, it says, oh, God, it hurts over and over again. Um, Long story, but if you see that, just text me a picture on Twitter. Have you thought about like mailing out the stickers to your friends from all over the country and the world and asking them to distribute it? That's a really good idea. I should do that for sure. Yep. 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 yep, yep. I'd be more. I'd be more than happy. I'm in the Pacific Northwest. If you want to mail yep. some over, I'd be more than happy to go out there on my hikes and everything. That's a great you know? idea. Oh, that'd be so cool. Okay. Matt's yeah, we're definitely wild. gonna do that. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, Absolutely. cool, cool. Um, what else? I, oh, I was going to ask. So before you chipped your hand, like mm -hmm. when did you first get this thought? Like, oh, I should microchip my hand. And then yeah. how did, like, where do you go 
to get chipped? Like, right. is this a dumb Where, question? Like, do you just go to a tattoo no, that's not a dumb or like, question how does one get chipped? <laughs> yeah, that's not a dumb question at all. And, and that was like one of the weirder, not weirder things, but like one of the like super unknown things. And I was like, okay, cool. You buy the chip off the internet because there's a company that has them. It's called dangerousthings.com. It's filled with dangerous things. Um, and you buy this chip and it's, you know, again, the exact same tech, uh, they've done some custom stuff with the chip so that you can rewrite it with the, the RFD, for example, um, you can change the idea of, which is traditionally not supported. Um, but it lets you like clone an, your business card or your building card and put it on your hand. Um, but yeah, a friend of mine, uh, whose name is Lee, they're a maker artist person. I met them in San Francisco and, um they have a lot of implants and of course the biohacking scene is a whole rabbit hole like you can you can go down the rabbit hole on the internet and people are doing amazing amazing wild things uh to their body with technology um and it took me 24 hours to get over the idea and be like okay yeah maybe this is something i could do to my body because it's i'm not going to say it's an identical leap but it's a very similar leap to the idea of getting a tattoo um, or a piercing. It's just that those are much more normalized and everyone knows about them and you can just walk into a corner store and do it and it's safe and fine. Um, it's a really similar process. Um, and so, yeah, you order the chip online. It's about a hundred bucks. Uh, it has NFC and RFID. There's a bunch of different things. Have fun browsing that. Um, and then you can find um, someone who to do it. And the way I did that was they have a relatively out of date map on the internet of like piercing artists, tattoo artists who have done this before. Um, and so I browsed that and then found somebody in uh, San Jose originally to do this one and then uh, Bushwick to do this one. And um, I can wholeheartedly recommend the person in Bushwick. They were amazing. Um, so if anyone is in New York area and wants to, um, or actually they're in Williamsburg. So even, even easier to get to, um, if you're in the New York area and you want to do this, let me know and I'll put y'all in touch. Um, they were excellent. And it's just like someone who knows about the skin, uh, cause this thing lives in a very specific pocket of skin, um, sort of in between two layers. So it doesn't, you know, move around. Um, did it, did it hurt? Yeah. Have you gotten a tattoo before or, or piercings? Or yeah. Anything? Got a bunch. Um, oh yeah. 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 Okay. So well. compared to, compared to a tattoo, how, like how much does it hurt? Um, much more, but it's also over in 10 to 30 seconds. Um, yeah, I'm not going to lie. It, it hurts. Um, and it's not for the squeamish. I almost passed out, not from pain, but from the act of modifying my body that like, Oh God, I just changed myself. Um, when I got this one, but I just sat down and ate some M&Ms and was fine. Um, but yeah, no, getting this one, I mean, I won't go into details on the podcast because I don't know who's listening. Um, but this is uh, much, the side is, is a bit more um, involved. And um, yeah, I mean, it hurts for 10, 30 seconds and then it swells for two days and then you're fine. And I'm, I live a very active lifestyle. So rock climbing and boxing and everything. And it's just... You know, it's a bunch of fat. It doesn't do anything. On so you your can't side feel it. You can't feel it in your hand at all. I can feel this one since it's close enough to the surface, and that's one of the party tricks: is have people you know touch it and feel it moving around. Um, but this one is is pretty deep in the middle of between my thumb and forefinger, and it's just kind of fatty there. And so, like, I can't even feel it. I don't. I don't even know where it is. Um, but obviously, it would show up on an X ray rather clearly. And then if. If you, oh yeah, that's a good point. Or, or like, what if you go through security at the airport? Well, will, will, will you set off the alarm? I was worried about that as a nomad traveler person, but um, no, it's it's the less it's less um, metal than like a tooth filling. Um, it's really like nobody notices ever. Um, so I'm not going to say put your private keys on it because it's a public space; anybody can scan it. Um, but if you wanted to smuggle that like encryption key or something through the border for whatever reason, like you could put it there. Um, but no, yeah, it's, it's a truly small amount of metal. And, um, I think I can go into, um, what's that called? The magnetic MRI machine, um, up to some, I think eight MEV. I got to clarify that, but yeah, you can go into most MRIs 
but of course I have it written on my like Apple uh, health ID. It's like, has chips in hand, <laughs> know that. <laughs> Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, that's super interesting. I feel like I have to just like look into this more because I have more questions, you know, like about logistically, how does it work? And like, now I'm kind of curious if there's more people out there with chips in their hands or in their body somewhere. And there's this whole like community. Do you know, have you met anyone? I have met two people so far that have chips in their hand. One of them is Lee and the other is, um, uh, Gonzo from the Casa Art House, a sort of crypto art collective here in New York. Um, he was inspired by mine and just got his, so that's really exciting. Um, but yeah, yeah, I think there's a surprising number of people doing this online, and it's the obviously the internet makes it easy to see, you know, what people are posting, and so it's kind of like the stuff people are doing is incredible. I highly recommend anyone go start start with like the dangerous things for them and browse what people are, are um, sort of talking about. Yeah, for sure. Um, a couple of other questions about uh, the many mats. First of all, is there a limited number of mats out there? Like at a certain point, will people, like, will you, will people be able to go meet you when you're 50 and scan your hand? That's a great question. I imagine so. Um, the way it I didn't really have any grand plans for it beyond the original four stickers, but the way it's happening, excuse me, um, the way it seems to be turning out is I'll have um, a series of four stickers, um, all commissioned from right now the same artist, uh, Seymour Butts on Instagram. Um, they're amazing. Um, and I think what I'll do is make it such that when the new series comes out, the previous series is um, rarer and have that become more rare over time such that like if you see that someone has a buddha mat for example you know that they were there early and they're you know uh someone who met me in 2021 or something um yeah and right now i have it such that the buddha mats are the rarest and then the bagel mat and then i think the moto mat no then the piracy mat and then the moto mat um yeah. And so if you get a bagel mat, like, oh, amazing. Um, and if you get a Buddha mat, that's incredible because there's a sort of an exponential rarity curve at the moment. Um, but I'm going to make that much more accessible. Um, yeah. Yeah, that, that's super cool. And then do you see like other people or brands or uh, do you see this becoming a thing that like other people do in the future, whether it's like microchipping your hand, you know, for individuals or artists or uh, whether it's, you know, just having like QR codes on stickers that are out, out on the streets where you can scan it and get an NFT, these sorts of things, do you see that becoming more and more commonplace? Honestly, yeah. I think um, I think it's a really natural expression of this whole uh, memorabilia aspect of NFTs is tap your phone, scan a code, get a thing, and now you have this tangible digital memorabilia. Um and like what's new about this is truly just the medium of the NFT. Because previously you have digital event tickets. I have an email in my inbox of that time I went to this festival. Like it's the same idea, but that just doesn't hit. It just doesn't make my brain go, yeah, that time I was at the festival. But with an NFT, it does, right? I have the um, tickets to whatever developer conference. I'm like, yeah, that was the time I went to that conference. Um, it's like, the the medium of an nft is just like the the fact that i own it is is the unlock for me for this like memorabilia concept and so yeah i totally see that happening you go to an event you get a memorabilia nft full stop end of story like maybe that's used in the future but it doesn't have to be like i think that's cool enough on its own um yeah would love for more people to be doing this um the software that i wrote is called drop nifties um d-r-o-p dot nifties with the dot es it's a domain thing um, or like a overly clever domain, um, but it's generalized software. So anyone can use it to distribute an NFT and I'm going to ideally make it like integrate with one of the L2s and then, uh, make it so that anyone can like use a little dashboard to set up what NFTs they want to drop and stuff like that. But, um, yeah, totally, totally is the future. So cool. So another project I want to talk about, uh, that is also very creative, I think is called proof of stake. 
but it's not what most people are thinking of proof of stake. It's proof of the food stake, S T E A K. Um, tell me about this. This is like a very well thought out and like fully drawn out project. It's not just a joke at all. There's a whole white paper on it. There's a whole stake network. There's a stake token. There's like all of these things. Um, so yeah. Can you explain what proof of stake is? Yeah. Um, so this is back in 2018, most likely towards the end, I believe. Um, I was working with the Truebit um, team at the time and just like, you know, working on Truebit. And for anyone who's not familiar, Truebit was this idea of pretty much it's like what rollups are doing these days, but they didn't know about um, zero knowledge proofs. And so it was like sort of a very primitive idea of a rollup where you would have this off chain computation and then publish the result on chain. And if anyone disagreed, they could challenge you to this game and this like sort of um, sort of a, what was it called? The, the challenge game, there was a cool name for it. Um, and so you would then execute this off chain computation on solidity in a little VM inside the VM and prove its interaction over time. And so if someone was like, Hey, add these numbers together for me. And then I come back with like, okay, it's eight. And then someone else is watching also adds the numbers and like, I got 13, I'm going to challenge you. They would do the operation on chain to get an, an official result. Um, verification game, that's what it was called. And so I was looking at this and I was like, cool. Um, the idea of off chain computation is sort of the same idea of how do you verify qualitative information? Um, the idea that like, in this case, like, is this a picture of a piece of stake or not? Um, and so I was like, just like playing around with this idea of like, aha, proof of stake, that's a funny idea. But then I was like, wait, Truebit can be used to theoretically prove whether or not a picture is a piece of stake. And then, of course, a lot of comedy is in doing way too much work uh, on a really silly idea. And so that's what happened is I took the idea of a proof of stake to its logical extreme, uh, wrote a white paper using Truebit v1 as the base and uh, renamed all of the roles in the protocol. So you have like the grill master and the backseat grillers. And so if the grill master um you know says it's this but the backseat grillers can be like no that's not correct that's not a stake um that's the challenge game and then it was really really fun to do the um content for this and so there's a whole white paper um we did uh an ico well an ics an initial um oh iso initial stake offering something like that we <laughs> we raised money uh donated it to different projects um and then distributed a bunch of stake tokens. There are trillions of them. So if you want some stake tokens, hit me up. They're like a little uh, memorabilia of the past, so to speak. Um, maybe that's the next uh, moon coin, who knows? Um, but yeah, and then, yeah, it was just a really fun way to like educate people about this Truebit protocol, as well as like do some good and give everybody a laugh while they're doing it. Um, if you'd like to check it out, I think it's still up. It's S-T-E-A-K dot network. Yeah, yeah. I just saw it the other day, so it definitely is still up. Um, I was also surprised when I opened the white paper. Well, I was surprised to even see that there was a white paper. Right. And so, of course, I was intrigued and I was like, I got to see this. Yeah. And I was expecting to just see like a one pager or maybe just like a joke. It is oh, no. pretty long. Like there are pages of this and it looks it's, like it a could theoretically work. It white paper <laughs> yeah i think it i i i i think it could theoretically work i mean obviously the problems in truebit v1 have been well discussed and i think they're on some other version of the protocol now um but like it's plausible um and i really enjoyed writing the paper because of course i was trying to parody the whole 2017 ico boom um so the website has that particles.js uh script at the top with the networked lines and then every every section of the website is tilted by 2.5 degrees like every website this was just every website and so i was just poking at that and so in that same vein i was like cool i'm gonna write a real white paper um with greek letters and everything um yeah, it was really fun. I love that. Yeah, Matt Stevenson would be proud of you. Probably he probably was proud of you mm. when you wrote. It looks like something a PhD yep. student would would write. Definitely like following in in his steps. Yep. Yeah. Cool. All yeah. right. So, I really enjoy uh, comedy as a as a sorry. I, I enjoy comedy as like a yeah. um a medium to teach things. 
Um, I think it's a really effective way to deliver a message. And obviously a lot of people, um, you know, you can use that in so many different amazing ways and people use comedy uh, to deliver news. Now that's like the main way you get your news as a millennial or something. Um, but I also think it's a fun way to educate people on all kinds of things. I completely agree. And you're really good at it. So keep keep doing what you're doing. Yeah. So uh, a couple of final questions about, you know, looking forward to the future. What does the future of NFTs look like? And so in the, in the early part of this year, we saw NFT artwork really blow up. Um, I'm curious, you know, for starters, like what do you see as the next big NFT use case that's going to blow up? That's actually that ties into something that someone mentioned on Twitter in the um, thread that was like, what should we talk about during this podcast is someone asked, um, what's the NFT use case that no one's talking about? Um, and I think that this ties in really well to what we were talking about before with like the environment uh, where an NFT lives. I think what people are sleeping on right now is the idea of a screensaver NFT, um, an NFT that is also your computer screensaver. Um, and the reason for that is twofold. One, obviously generative art screensavers, like cool, hand in hand, great. Um, three is that it is the only that I can think of natural digital space on my computer for a piece of art to exist. Um, besides my background, which everyone's familiar with and kind of doesn't hit for me. I leave my background, the defaults on most things. Um, but the screensaver, now that's a way to express your personality. Um, and so I think that's a, a really interesting domain that um, as of right now, the only one that I know about is the first NFT that was ever sold to a museum um, is Harm Van Dorpel's um, event savers or event listeners. And that's a screensaver. Um, and so that's like an idea that is really old in crypto terms, but I think should be new again. I've never thought about that, but also what about like Zoom backgrounds too? Oh, totally. Zoom backgrounds. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And you saw people doing that during the pandemic a little bit. Like um, people would put uh, like a QR code over here or um, people would like in um, OG NFT uh, MP was showing off different crypto artworks in her Zoom background. And I thought that was fantastic because it's just, it's like the digital wall. It's a very natural place for you to uh, express yourself. Like I'm doing it right now with all of these things in my room. Um, so it's like, yeah, just make an NFT, like do that with the digital stuff and it feels fantastic. Um, so yeah, I feel like that's a very natural progression. Um, after that, future of NFTs, um, I look forward to um, right now, the value and interest in NFTs is uh, sort of um, denominated or, um, the most like the reason people are interested is primarily because of the sense of history or like um the medium itself is new and so you have this sort of follow-on effect of where any random nft could be valuable because it's an nft and the interest in such is because it's an nft and it's this sort of like cyclical process and so i look forward to the day when the idea that it's an nft is boring and um then you just collect stamps of memorabilia from concerts and that's just an application of an nft um yeah hard to say um what the future will look like i mean anyone who attempts to predict the future um will almost certainly be wrong okay cool yeah i totally hear you on the screensaver thing i think that is uh definitely going to be a use case that we'll be seeing in the future um and then I, another thing i wanted to ask you is like if you could time travel into the future and plop yourself down 10 years into the future in 2031 and looking around you like describe to me how people are interacting with nfts on a day-to-day -day basis and for me you know like one one use case that i'm really excited about that I think we'll all be using in 10 years, hopefully, is more of like a, it's not like anything super creative or exciting. It's just something practical, like being able to keep all our personal identifier, identifying information on the blockchain. To me, um, as NFTs is like something that I'm actually really excited about just from a convenience standpoint. So being able to like mint your driver's license as an NFT, your passport, you know, for traveling, your insurance documents, your home, like uh, proof of home ownership, um, your health records, like anything that's a unique asset that is like a, a that 
personal identifier for you, you can mint that on the NFT. And I just picture us going around with, you know, all of this on our phones and having immediate access to all of these things. And I think that's something that's really going to change how we operate day to day and like make that make our day to day like more convenient and faster and easier. Yeah, piggybacking off of that, um, identity is, of course, non fungible in its spe specificity. And so it's like, a sort of natural, um, like extension of how we use digital stuff is to think about that um, digital identity. I, I, it's it's absolutely inevitable that digital identity comes to pass. Um, obviously, privacy is TBD, but um, it's 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 absolutely inevitable. Um, one of the things that I I guess there are two broad ideas around NFTs specifically that I think are inevitable. Um, first is the rather simple idea of integrations or more importantly uh, interoperability um, for these objects um, what's happening with specifically nfts um, and ethereum is that for the first time digital objects all obey the same substrate which is to say that any nft is guaranteed to support the idea of owning it um, and transferring it to someone else and destroying it. Um, and that's something that is weirdly um, not a given in our previous digital, like in Web 2.0. Um, the idea that like every owned object can obey a similar API is really, really wild. And so you get this interoperability where, okay, cool, we put titles on the blockchain. So like house titles. Um, that itself, like in the closed ecosystem of like, I want to transfer a title to someone else, like marginal improvements, um, because now I can just send a title to someone. I don't have to go. I don't even know how that works. You probably go in an office and they fucking rifle through some manila folders and pick something up and put it somewhere else. Like that's probably how it works. Um, and so like technological improvement to be sure. It's just, so, it's just so slow too. It's, right. such, it's such a process and it's okay. so slow. Yeah, I've, I've never bought a house. So I don't know how it works, but I can only assume it's horrible. Um, and so you get that benefit. But what's really cool is now that everything obeys that same API substrate, you can take your title and plug it into a DeFi lending thing. You can plug it in to something else. You can take a digital mortgage against it. Like you can do all of this other things all of these things, the only requirement is that something be an object, right? And so in the real world to uh, do like a loan thing, like it, everything gets so specific. And so you have like cars and houses and those are all different. And if you want to do a loan thing with your car, that's different than doing a loan thing with your house. Like it's, but when everything's an NFT, it's all the same. Now, of course, there's context specific things like value, valuing a house is very different from valuing a car. Um, but at the end of the day, the protocols are identical. And I think that's just really neat. And so we're going to get into some like very cool um, sort of second order effects or expressions of this. So like once your driver's license is an NFT, now when I sign into a website, I don't have to type my fucking number in all the time. I just connect my wallet, approve that it can access my driver's license and blah, blah, blah. Like this is basic self-sovereignty stuff. And then ta-da, it works. Like that's cool. Um, it can also be dystopian. So, you know, privacy, et cetera. But it's also like, that's going to be really, really cool. Um, and then after that, I think one of the larger trends in the world in 10 years will be the rise of collectively owned networks. Um, and that's really like, if you're in the crypto space, that's like nothing new. Um, but I think it is a sort of inevitability. And it's kind of interesting uh, from a uh, like a business competitiveness standpoint as well, is that collectively owned networks do have a um, advantage over centralized um, services. And the answer and the reason for that is people have a vested interest um, and having a vested interest does wild things to people's loyalty and their like motivation to do things. Um, that's why startup employees work is because they have a vested interest in this thing. That's why, um, you know, all of these different, that's like why a lot of things happen. Um, and so when you give that vested interest to the people, and so, for example, with like, um, is it USAA that is like sort of a co-op thing? It's like they redistribute their, 
profits um, yearly to their uh, owners or to the you know the people who use it because it's collectively owned. And so it's like that's a really powerful network effect. And I think that it's sort of inevitable that with NFTs and with crypto more broadly, that organization of collectivism uh, comes to pass. And we see that happening today. And so I think I would hope that in 10 years, that's like really, really normal. And starting a DAO with the homies is really, really normal. Um, and, you know, that's a, that sort of thing of using this power of like social dynamics and co-ownership and on-chain governance and everything um, simply produces better organizations, better firms. Yeah, yeah, for sure. When you think about where we are in the ecosystem today and where we want to end up in 10 years, hopefully, what do you see as being some of the biggest roadblocks or barriers for us to get? Like, why aren't we there yet, I guess, is what I'm asking. And um, what are some of the solutions to that? And like, do you do you can you think of any projects that are already building solutions that you think, you know, this is it, like this is really going to make a difference sort of thing? Two things that I think of, uh, actually quite a few. One is that um, I'm looking at tweets today and they could have been written in 2018. Uh, the tweets like, wow, onboarding sucks. Who's working on this? Or I can't believe MetaMask is still this popular. Who's working on a blah, blah, blah. Um, those are the same tweets. Like that tweet would exist just fine in 2018. Um, and so that's like an interesting uh, thing to note is, yeah, this the like onboarding and identity are still really, really identical to what they were before. Like finally we have um, like Argent, for example, with Guardians, we have uh, an actual in production version of a smart wallet where you, um, you, you manage your identity with your friends as recovery agents. And that's, that's really cool. People were like proposing that in 2018 and now it exists. So that's cool. Um, same thing with like Gnosis Safe, generally available multi-sig. Same thing with like Aragon and Moloch and like all these DAOs. It's like, cool, now these things actually exist. Um, but we were talking about them in 2018, 2019. Like, um, and so it may just be that progress takes time. Um, there is a, there's an idea that like all progress happens at a generational pace. Um, you know, the internet became what it is today um, within like 30 years, which is about the length of a generation um it's uh i forget maybe it was like i forget which newsletter pointed this out but like almost all technological shifts happened on a 30-year time scale or something along those lines that like area and the reason for that i think was generational um there's a sort of quote that my co-founder aj likes to say which is something along the lines of you know everything that changes from zero to 15, like I'm unaware of, um, anything that changes from 15 to 25 is just how the world is. And then anything that changes from 25 to 35 is good progress. And anything that changes after 45 is moral decay. Um, and the idea is that like, yeah, as you grow up, as the next generation grows up, they grow up in the world that has been created and they assume that it's the default. I grew up on the cusp of the internet, right? Like I'm a zillennial, so I didn't have a phone until I was 16, uh, but then my life has been internet thereafter. Um, Gen Z grew up with the internet. The internet has always existed to them. And that's just a fundamentally different way of viewing the world. And so I think in that way, um, much like that sort of skeuomorphism medium shift, it, the internalizations that we've made based on our um, the way we've grown up, like those affect how we think. And it's a really simple, like, not simple, but straightforward ideas is like, yeah, maybe there are things we can't see because of these baked in um, experiences, these baked in prejudices, these baked in whatever, um, that we simply are unable to overcome because of how baked in they are. And it's simply the next generation that understands the medium perfectly, because there's no other option. Um, so, yeah, I imagine um, the reason we're where we are today is simply because it hasn't been enough time, um, which is, I don't know, uh, an interesting take. I wouldn't call it cynical or specifically hopeful, um, but yeah, I think we just need more time. And I think if you look at like the internet and parallel that to NFTs, we are about ten years down the road. Um, we're in like 1998, 
1994 even of like computer right and so it's like yeah it's kind of not surprising that onboarding still sucks and like when you get your personal pc you have to put it together and that sucks like it's you know it's it's the same vibe so i'm i'm kind of not surprised um that things are still the way they are um but obviously there's progress like in 2018 you ha- you you had to start every conversation with explaining what nft stands for and then you've lost and now finally everyone has done that for us and you can just say nft and people are like oh yeah nft that's amazing that's incredible but yeah so i think time time is the answer yeah for sure and hopefully this cycle will take not as long as the other cycles because now we're already in an internet world and so this isn't like so brand new to us you know i i think the jump from nothing to internet was a bigger jump than from it from web 2 to web 3 like where we are today so hopefully it won't take that's a great point yeah Um, but also i think the people today are you know like everybody everybody on social media today has the attention span of a goldfish basically like you just like nobody has right. patience for anything yeah. so it's like if we have this idea we can see the future mm-hmm, mm-hmm. we want it to happen tomorrow and the fact of the matter is when you're building out an entire yeah. web infrastructure it's going to take you know longer yeah. than that to do so it's going to take a lot of time yeah yeah 100 percent um, but I do feel it's inevitable and obviously everyone working in the space kind of feels that as well. Yeah, a hundred percent. Okay. Well, we are well yeah. over an hour, so we got to wrap this up. Um, the last thing I like to do on every <laughs> podcast episode is a segment called explain your tweet, where I go through your Twitter, pull out some cryptic or interesting tweets Ooh. and give you a chance to explain it. So, uh, this first one okay. I have is from June 30th, 2021. You said there's only one thing hotter than NFTs right mm-hmm. now. What was that? <laughs> <laughs> I honest, I remember tweeting that and there was an answer, um, but I forgot what it was. Um, and I think the joke was, I think it was really hot in New York at the time. And so I think that was the joke is that it was just hot in New York. Um, but I do prefer the, um, the answer that the only thing hotter than NFTs right now is me, I think was the funniest response. Um, gotcha. I did look through but the yeah, comments. That was, I think it was New York. Answer. I think New York was hotter. Oh, got it. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Okay. All right. Cool. The next one I have is um, from June 13th, 2021. You said a bar at the climbing gym called On the Rocks. I just have to call that out because that is like so your style of humor. And also, you should make it happen. Yep. See, this is what I'm saying with Vital, the new gym. They have a little. Um, they have a little uh, restaurant thing next to the rocks and um, they called it refuge, which like I get cool. It's aesthetic. It's Brooklyn, but on the rocks. Yeah. Ah! That's a missed opportunity for sure. And um, missed opportunity and they could sell alcohol. I don't know about alcohol and rock climbing together, but like on the rocks. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Oh man. Okay. And then I've got one final yeah, tweet I do for love you. That. This is from, this is from uh, June 13th. Okay. Also, 2021, a big Twitter day for you. You said, if you want NFT thought leader, Matt, all those mm. tweets are in 2018. We've locked him in the past. He was simply too powerful to be left alone. <laughs> <laughs> yep. What, like, what um, happened? I think at the time, I think it was Mike. Yeah, Mike shouted me out on Twitter. And so a bunch of people followed me. Um he was like, go follow Matt for NFT things. And I wanted to clarify to the like 100 or so new people that like if you want the thought leader stuff that's in 2018 and like i said that's still just as applicable today like it's all the same questions all the same like things like it's all it's very thought leader so it's very it's kind of embarrassing in retrospect but um yeah it's all there and i think those tweets could exist in 2021 and be just fine um but yeah, so if you do want to see the progression of a thought leader and Matt discovering philosophy 101 as he attempts to figure out what ownership means and like discovering art uh, art theory 101 and trying to figure out like what is aura, um, that's, that's what you want to follow. It's a very live blog version of like how I came to understand NFTs. You should just go back to all of those tweets from 2018 and start retweeting them or just start quote tweeting them and saying this I is should well do for that. all of them. <laughs> yeah. 
I think I'll do that. Great idea. <laughs> I'm going to write that down. I love it. <laughs> all right. Awesome. Well, that's all I got for you, Matt. I really appreciate you taking the time today to come on the podcast. I feel like we could just chat forever about things. So I'm going to make totally. the executive decision to cut it off here, <laughs> respecting your time and mine. <laughs> um, I definitely want to and listeners meet up well. next time. Yeah, and listeners, I definitely want to meet up next time I'm in New York uh, because I need to scan your hand. Yeah, that's for sure. Um, and exactly. send me those stickers too. I'd be more than happy to go put them all around the wilderness on my hikes out here in the Northwest. Oh, amazing. That'd be such a good idea. Yeah, I'm going to do that. Sweet. Awesome. Okay. Well, last thing, Matt, before you go, tell people where they can find you if they want to get in touch with you, have follow-up questions for you. Um, and then feel free to plug any projects you're working on at the moment that you want people to check out. Yeah, Totally. I'm on Twitter at one of the many mats. That's the number one and then of the many mats. And then on Instagram, O N E of the many mats um, on Instagram. I just post pictures of doors though. So uh, you, I hope you like doors if you follow that. Um, yeah. And then what I'm working on right now, um, working on drop nifties and also playing around with this stickers protocol that I won't go into, but um, by the time this comes out, check out my Twitter and I'm sure it'll be there. Um, it's called epoxy and it's this like NFT, um, protocol with some interesting financial stuff. Um, pretty, pretty short and sweet. Um, but yeah, that's me. Thanks for listening, everybody. Awesome. Thanks again so much for being here, Matt. Thank you everybody for tuning in and we'll, we'll be back again soon with another episode of the unstoppable podcast.